And then 1.18.4 Monks, I know not of any other single person fraught with such loss to many folk, such discomfort to many folk, with such loss, discomfort and sorrow to devas and mankind as Makali, that infatuated man. Just as monks, at a river mouth, one sets a fish trap to the discomfort, suffering, distress and destruction of many fish. Even so, Makali, that infatuated infatuated man was born into the world methinks to be a man trapped for the discomfort, suffering, distress and destruction of many beings. Uh, in this sutta, the Buddha uh, did not hesitate uh, to speak badly of Makali Gosala Putta, one who had wrong view because uh, he was leading many folk uh, into the woeful plains. And sometimes people think that the Buddha was such a nice man uh, that he cannot criticize another person. Uh, it's not true. Uh, the Buddha is, is willing uh, to benefit many people uh, and speak out uh, even to the, even uh, to name somebody uh, who was uh, leading some people in, to have wrong views. Uh. Uh, we were at 1.18. So today we start with 1.18.13. The Buddha said, Monks, just as even a trifling bit of dung has an evil smell, so likewise do I not favor existing even for a trifling time, not even for the lasting of a finger snap. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. Uh, the Buddha says that uh, he does not uh, want to exist uh, even for a trifling time. An existence to him uh, is likened to Dung, which has a bad smell. Eh? So that's how he views existence. Eh? Why does the Buddha uh, say that existence is uh, so um, uh, so uh, obnoxious, eh? sort of so uh, foul, eh? like uh, dung? Eh? It's because even Buddhas have to suffer, you know, because there are two types of suffering. One is mental suffering, the other one is physical suffering. The Buddha said that all Aryas eh, have done away with mental suffering, but they still have uh, physical suffering, and we cannot run away from physical suffering as long as we have a body, because uh, with a body we have uh, aging, uh, sickening and dying. And the Buddha said in uh, more than one sutta, uh, when he was old, uh, that his bo his uh, body was breaking up, and uh, it gave him a lot of uh, suffering. Uh, so even Buddhas uh, have to suffer. And some people are of the opinion that because uh, Buddhas and Arahants don't have a self, uh, that uh, they do not suffer. But if that is the case, eh, then eh, you can think, eh, uh, for example, if the Buddha uh, had uh, physical suffering eh, from the body, then if there was no, if it did not affect him, eh, there would have been no necessity for him eh, to enter into uh, deep jhanas eh, or cessation of perception and feeling. Eh. Um, which the Buddha did la, when the pain of the body was quite unbearable, he said he had to enter into deep states of uh, meditation la, uh, so that he did not experience uh, pain in the body. And then after that, he comes out of it. Uh, for some time, there is no pain, but later the pain might come back again. So there's one sutta in the Iti Buddhaka, it's 2.44. There the Buddha said, What bhikkhus is the Nibbana element with residue left? Here a bhikkhu is an arahan, one whose asavas are destroyed, the holy life fulfilled, who has done what had to be done, laid down the burden, attained the goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely released through final knowledge. However, his five sense faculties remain unimpaired, by which he still experiences what is agreeable and disagreeable, and he feels pleasure and pain, sukha and dukkha. It is the extinction of attachment, 
hate and delusion in him that is called the Nibbana element with residue left. Now what because is the Nibbana element with no residue left? Then he explains uh, the, the other part. So here the Buddha is saying because uh, Arahana still has the five sense faculties, uh, he feels Sukha and Dukkha. Uh, so that explains uh, why uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, existence, uh, uh, he, he doesn't want to exist uh, uh, even for a short time uh, if he if he uh, if he could uh. and this uh, you'll find uh, is quite uh, a different uh, from uh, some later books uh, we say that the buddha uh, sort of would come back again and again or uh, he's always uh, in existence uh. now the next sutta is uh, 1.19 1.19 there are several suttas here uh, but uh, I'll just choose one of them eh? the Buddha said even as monks in this rose apple land that is Jambu Deepa trifling in number are the pleasant parks the pleasant groves the pleasant grounds and lakes while more numerous are the steep precipitous places unfordable rivers dense thickets of stakes and thorns and inaccessible mountains. Just so few in number are those beings that welcome when they hear it, the Dhamma Vinaya, set forth by a Tathagata. More numerous are they that do not. And that's the end of the Sutta. Here the Buddha is saying that in India, the accessible places la, where people can use la, are very much less eh, than those places eh, which are inaccessible, eh, like uh, steep places, mountains, uh, dense uh, forests and jungle, unfordable rivers, etc. You must remember this sutta was spoken 2,500 years ago. So uh, the number, uh, the, the amount of inaccessible places eh, uh, was much more during that time uh, than now. And uh, the Buddha said that um, few people, uh, uh, just like the, 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 the amount of uh, places that are accessible, uh, so uh, small amount compared to the whole of India. Uh, so in the same way, few people uh, out of the many uh, want to listen to Dhamma Vinaya uh, Dhamma Vinaya is, uh, teaches us uh, the truth uh, or reality about existence. And it is uh, actually painful uh, to hear the reality of existence. And sometimes people uh, don't want to face the truth, don't want to face the reality. They would like to believe what they want to believe, what they like to believe. Uh, so... Uh, because of that, few people want to listen to the Dhamma and the disciplinary code taught by the Buddha, the Vinaya. So in other words, uh, we don't expect uh, to have many followers uh, of the Buddha's teaching. In fact, um, most Buddhas, uh, when they are enlightened, uh, do not want to teach. Just like our Buddha, uh, Gautama Buddha, after he was enlightened, he contemplated the minds of living beings and he found that few people are inclined to listen to the Dhamma. And even if they listen, few, uh, even fewer want to practice it. So he actually wanted to be a Pacheka Buddha. But later he was persuaded uh, by Maha, this uh, Brahma Sahampati uh, to turn the wheel of the Dhamma and he did so. Uh. Uh, we find um, this happens more more than once. Eh? That uh, sometimes the Buddha is not inclined to do something, and um, somebody appeals to him eh, to change his mind. Sometimes they appeal once he doesn't want to change his mind. Then they appeal a second time, still he doesn't want to change his mind. But when they appeal the third time, eh, out of compassion, eh, he will change his mind and uh, do something that at first he was not inclined to do. Lah. 
So this shows uh, that actually Pacheka Buddhas uh, are able to teach, but it's just that they are not inclined to teach. It's not like some of the later books uh, say that Pacheka Buddhas are unable to teach uh, because whatever path uh, that they have walked through, uh, it is very clear to them the path that they have walked through. So it, it shouldn't be uh, difficult at all uh, for them to teach. And uh, they would rather teach actually by uh, example. They show a good example of being a renunciant and they practice and perhaps uh, uh, people, if people ask them in, uh, individually uh, of the Dhamma, they might uh, teach, uh, but they're not inclined to teach to the whole world and uh, turn the Dhamma wheel. And some people think that that is selfishness, but it is not selfishness. Uh, because uh, it, it appears to me uh, that every being uh, has his own time, and the best teacher uh, uh, is suffering. Uh, because when we suffer enough, uh, and it will uh, bring us uh, to walk the path. Uh, if we have not uh, been in samsara, we are not suffered enough, we are not spiritually mature, uh, even if the Buddha is around, uh, we would not be inclined to uh, follow his teaching. So that, was, that is why uh, we find that during the Buddha's time, there were many people who did not want to follow the Buddha's teachings, uh, even though the Buddha was in the world. Now the next sutta is 1.19.2. The Buddha says, just as monks in this Jambudipa, rose apple land, uh, that is India, uh, trifling in number are the pleasant parks, the pleasant groves, the pleasant grounds and lakes, while more numerous are the steep, precipitous places, unfordable rivers, dense thickets of stakes and thorns, and inaccessible mountains. Just so few in number are those beings who, diseasing as men, are reborn among men. More numerous are those beings who, diseasing as men, are reborn in hell, who are reborn in the wombs of animals, who are reborn in the realm of ghosts. Uh, in the same way, uh, uh, just as uh, in India they are trifling in, in number, are the pleasant parks, pleasant groves, pleasant grounds and lakes, while more numerous are the steep, precipitous places, unfordable rivers, etc., etc. Just so few in number are those beings who, deceasing as men, are reborn among the devas. More numerous are those beings who, deceasing as men, are reborn in hell, in the wombs of animals, in the realm of ghosts. So in the same way, eh, the sutta continues, Few in number are those beings who, diseasing as devas, are reborn as devas, or are reborn as men. More numerous are those beings who, diseasing as devas, are born into the three woeful planes of hell, the animal realm, and the realm of ghosts. In the same way, similarly, Few in number are those beings uh, who, deceasing from hell or from the animal realm or from the ghost realm, are reborn as men uh, or as devas. More numerous uh, are those beings uh, who, deceasing from hell, from the animal realm, from the ghost realm, uh, are reborn back into the hell realm or in the animal realm or in the ghost realm. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So basically what the sutta is saying uh, is that uh, most men, uh, after they pass away, they are not, they don't come back into the human realm or go up into the deva realm. Instead, most of them go into the woeful planes, the three woeful planes, uh, hell, animal realm, and the ghost realm. Uh. Similarly, uh, uh, devas, most of the devas, when they pass away, uh, are reborn into the woeful planes. Few of them uh, are reborn uh, back as devas or as human beings. And even the beings from the woeful planes, uh, after they pass away, most of them are reborn back into the woeful planes and not into the human realm or the heavenly realm. Now, what amount are 
reborn it back into the woeful planes, for example, human beings, uh, I would give a, a very rough estimate. Uh, perhaps out of every 10 people, uh, out of every 10 human beings, uh, maybe only two or three uh, come back into the human realm, uh, human world, uh, or are reborn as devas. Uh, maybe seven or eight uh, out of 10 people uh, go down into the woeful plains. Uh. So from there, uh, we can realize uh, that uh, it is quite uh, dangerous. Uh, and uh, we should not be like most people, most ordinary people. Uh, they live a very ordinary life and then they go into the uh, woeful plains because they follow their inclinations, they follow all their uh, lower instincts. Uh, it would appear like the number of beings uh, in the in the in the world, uh, every world system, uh, is like a pyramid. You know, the higher you go, the less beings there are. The lower you go, the more beings there are. The base is very wide. The top is very narrow. Uh, uh, the other thing here you can see uh, is that the the woeful plains mentioned here. And throughout the suttas uh, are only three, you know. That is the first one, the lowest one is the hell realm. And slightly above that is the animal realm. And uh, and uh, better than the animal realm, uh, according to some sutta, is the realm of ghosts. So there are only three uh, planes of existence in the woeful planes. Later books uh, added another plane called the asura plane. But uh, when we check with the uh, suttas, uh, we find that it contradicts the sutta. Because in the sutta, uh, two suttas in the Diga Nikaya, one says that the lowest type of asuras uh, are the Kalakanja asuras. And then later in another sutta, it is stated that the Kalakanja asuras are also devas. Uh, so we can see uh, that... Uh, if the lowest kind of asuras are devas, then all of the asuras must be devas. Uh, so, uh, there are only three woeful planes, uh, not four, according to the suttas. Now, the next sutta is 1.20.1. The Buddha said, Truthfully, monks, these are to be reckoned as gains, forest dwelling, living on arms, wearing rag robes, wearing three robes only, teaching the Dhamma, mastery of the Vinaya, wide knowledge, the rank of an elder, Thera, the blessing of true deportment, the blessing of a following, the blessing of a large following, as a man of good family, a, flair, a fair complexion, pleasant speech, to be content with little, and freedom from sickness. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, these things are really worth gaining. These are good things uh, to have, to practice. Uh, I would give you a lot of blessing. The first one is forest dwelling. This is m basically for monks. Uh, uh, the word forest is actually a translation of the word, I think, aranya. Aranya is basically a secluded place, a quiet place. And usually the Buddha mentions a uh, place like a cave up in the for, uh, up in the hills, um, a valley, uh, a quiet, secluded place, uh, basically. Because uh, if a monk wants to practice well, uh, it is best to, to, to live uh, uh, in such places. Uh. The second one, also for monks, is living on arms. That means to go on arms round. Uh, this is a very good practice for monks because it is not something easy to do. Uh, sometimes you go on arms round, people are quite rude to you. They just ask you to show off or something like that. And uh, or they just ignore you or they give you a rude stare or something. And uh, it, it's uh, very good uh, for our ego. Uh, if we want to wear away our ego, uh, these are some of the things uh, which are very helpful uh, that's why it's not easy to be a monk. Some people 
uh, they don't realize that and uh, they uh, don't appreciate monks enough uh, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a loss to them. Uh, third one is wearing rag robes. Rag robes here is a translation for Pangsukula Chivara. Pangsukula, uh, this robe, this, this, uh, the meaning of it uh, is that it is picked up, a cloth that is picked up during the Buddha's time, according to the uh, later books, uh, something like uh, 20 or 25 years, the first 20 or 25 years of the Buddha's uh, uh, ministry. Yeah? Uh, he and his disciples only wore uh, robes uh, that were made from uh, uh, cloth that was picked up, uh, and they would go to these uh, what they call charnel grounds, uh, cemeteries, uh, places where dead bodies were thrown, uh, and um, the cloth that was left over, uh, the monks would go and pick it up, or from uh, whatever place uh, where the cloth was thrown away, uh, they would pick it up and. Uh, uh, sew them into a robe. But later, um, the lay disciples of the Buddha asked uh, the Buddha for permission to give robes to the monks and the, out of compassion for them uh, to give people a, a chance to cultivate merit. Uh, the Buddha allowed uh, uh, lay people uh, to make offerings to uh, monks, uh, sometimes, uh, lay people, some pay, lay people, uh, don't, uh, don't realize, uh, uh, that, uh, it is, uh, their good fortune, uh, to be able to give to monks. And, uh, uh, that is, uh, that is the, the Buddha's, uh, so that's about rank robes. And the third one, the fourth one is wearing three robes only. Uh, the robes of a monk, uh, 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 generally stated to be three. One is the sabung, or what sometimes it's called the sarung. Eh? And then this robe that we are wearing is a shivara, shivon. And then there's another one that's two laid, double laid. Eh? That is uh, for use as a blanket. Eh? Then uh, teaching dhamma. Teaching dhamma is also a good thing. Eh? The Buddha encouraged the teaching of dhamma. Uh, that's why the Buddha, uh, you find uh, during the Buddha's time uh, and up to now, uh, uh, that the Buddha encouraged his monks to teach the Dhamma and not uh, all monks taught Dhamma and not all monks taught meditation. There were some monks who were meditation monks and some monks who were Dhamma preachers and some monks who mastered both. And um, during the Buddha's time, there were many types of monks, uh, and the Buddha allowed uh, all of them to do what was they, what they thought was best for them. And the mastery of the Vinaya, uh, another one also concerning monks, uh, is mastery of the Vinaya rules, uh, the disciplinary law rules. Uh, and uh, if they could live by the disciplinary code, uh, that would uh, uh, accumulate. They would accumulate a lot of blessings. The next one is white knowledge. White knowledge is a translation for Bahu Satcha. That means uh, a, a lot of uh, knowledge uh, of the Dhamma. Uh, um, the Buddha said, uh, uh, very few people uh, can teach the, very few people can teach the Dhamma according to the, the real uh, essence, the real um, Dhamma that the Buddha taught. Then the next one is the rank of an elder. An elder here is a monk. Uh, a tera is one who has ten vasas and above. Uh, a monk who has ten vasas and above is a monk who can ad uh, ordain uh, new monks. A monk who has ten vasas and above can accept disciples. Uh, the Buddha did not allow a younger monk uh, to accept uh, disciples, but uh, the Buddha asked the monks to uh, practice for the first 10 years eh, to get a lot of experience then after that only to accept disciples eh. that's why uh, the, to be an elder eh, is a blessing eh. the blessing of true deportment that means a monk who can conduct himself well eh, uh, that is uh, a, a good blessing eh. then the blessing of a following that means uh, if a monk can have a following eh, of disciples eh, 
uh, that uh, that is a blessing. Um, this uh, following can be lay disciples or uh, monk disciples. And during the Buddha's time, uh, we find that uh, several monks they had a large following of uh, monk disciples. And nowadays, uh, we find that uh, not many monks are able to have a following of uh, monk disciples. Some of them have a following of lay disciples. But to be have to have a following of a uh, Monk disciples, eh? uh, it is uh, very good, especially for the religion, because uh, there is always a shortage of monks. Eh? The blessing of a large following, uh, to have a, a, a big following uh, of uh, lay disciples and uh, monk disciples. Uh, during the Buddha's time, he sometimes he would walk around with 1,250 monks, and uh, he would go from place to place. And that would be really impressive. Uh, and the Buddha, why did the Buddha take such a large following with him? Uh, uh, it was not that... Uh, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's really very difficult to look after such a large amount of monks uh, and to travel in a group. It's a, a lot of... Uh, it's like an army moving. <laughs> There's a lot of logistics involved uh, to look after their food and all that. But uh, that is... Um, it's, it's, it's not easy to have a large following because uh, unless that person has enough uh, meta uh, and uh, enough uh, ability to teach, uh, there would not be many monks who would want to follow him. A man of good family, that means to be born into a good family. Uh, uh, a good family is not necessarily a rich family. A good family is one which is upright. Uh, who knows the Dhamma, uh, who follows the, the Dhamma, straightforward, uh, very simple people. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, not easy to find sometimes. A, fla- a fair complexion, uh, fair complexion, I think you all understand. Uh, pleasant speech, uh, to talk uh, pleasantly. Uh, this is one of the qualities uh, that endear a person to others. If a person speaks uh, uh, very rudely, unpleasant speech, uh, nobody likes to be ne- near him or her. The Buddha said, all of us are born with an axe in our tongue, in the Dhammapada. We are, if you're not careful, uh, we simply swing the axe and we hurt ourselves. Uh, uh, to be content with little, uh, somebody who has few, uh, few wishes, uh, few things to ask for, and freedom from sickness. Uh, this is uh, another uh, great blessing uh, to be seldom sick. Now, the next sutta is one uh, 1.20.2. The Buddha said, Monks, if even for the lasting of a finger snap, a monk should practice the first jhana, such a one may be called a monk. Not empty of result is his jhana. He abides doing the master's bidding. He is one who takes advice, and he eats the country's alms food to some purpose. What could I not say of one who makes much of the first jhana? Uh, this, in this sutta, the Buddha is praising uh, a monk uh, who can attain jhana even for a short, very short time, as as short as a finger snap. Uh, uh, so here, firstly, we find that uh, the Buddha praises jhana, uh, praises the attainment of jhana, and uh, uh, this is quite different from uh, nowadays. Some people uh, belittle jhana. Uh, the other thing we can uh, see from this uh, is that jhana can be attained even for a short moment. Uh, uh, even a person... Uh, the, how long a person can attain jhana and abide in jhana depends on uh, his, uh, how long he has cultivated it. Cultivated it. Now, if a person is new, has just attained jhana, it's not very stable and he could attain it for a short time. But with longer practice, perhaps he, could, he can abide in jhana for longer and longer. Uh, this jhana, I just like to explain a bit. This word jhana is sometimes uh, translated differently. Uh, years ago, they used to translate it as trance. 
and musing, etc. And more recently, they translated it as uh, absorption, uh, mental absorption. But the word jhana literally means, in candy sense, uh, bright, brightness. Uh. So uh, probably a uh, uh, translation which is nearer the root word uh, would be a state of mental incandescence. Uh, uh, because a person who can attain jhana, uh, his mind becomes bright. That's why when he's reborn into the jhana plane, uh, it becomes a being uh, with a lot of brightness. Uh. Now we go to the next sutta. 1.21.47 The Buddha said, Monks, they partake not of the deathless, who partake not of mindfulness of body. And 1.21.48 they who partake of mindfulness of body do indeed partake of the deathless. So here, the Buddha is saying that mindfulness of the body is extremely important. It can bring us to the deathless state. But here, it, uh, it is my personal opinion uh, that body here uh, includes the mind also. Uh, body sometimes, uh, uh, because there is some other uh, sutta where the Buddha mentions the body uh, with the uh, perceptions and mental workings. Uh, so here, even though it doesn't mention uh, perception and mental workings, uh, I would assume that it uh, includes uh, the mental part, uh, the mind, uh, because the body and the mind uh, are the two two things uh, that we associate with the self. The Buddha said uh, we always associate the self with the five khandhas. And the five khandhas, if you analyze it, uh, it is actually the body and four mental parts uh, which constitute the mind. 